my friendships uh, with women have been the the sort of powerful thread that has gotten me through every difficult moment mm -hmm. and the good ones. I'm Liz Feldman, uh, created uh, the show. I literally forgot the name of my show. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, I'm Liz Feldman, and uh, I created the show Dead to Me, starring Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini. I'm Meg Deloach. I have a family sitcom coming up on Netflix called Family Reunion, starring Loretta Devine, Tia Mowry. I'm Linda Evit Chavez. Um, my show is Hint the Five, and co created with Marvin Lemos. I'm Tanya Lewis Lee. Uh, my show is She's Gotta Have It. Uh, we just finished our second season. It's coming out May 24th. I'm Lisa Hannawalt, and I designed BoJack Horseman, and now I'm show running uh, and creator, creator of uh, Tuca and Birdie, starring Tiffany Haddish and Ali Wong. My name is Lauren Unarek. Um, I am the showrunner and co-creator of On My Block. I'm Yvette Lee Bowser. I'm the showrunner on Dear White People, which was created by the brilliant Justin Simeon. We just wrapped season three, so please watch seasons one and two so you're ready for season three. <laughs> <laughs> I am ready. Uh, so we should talk about the first we time. Should, we yeah. should talk about the first time. We really saw ourselves. Yeah, we really I'll ourselves. start because yeah. um, <laughs> it was a show Yvette worked on. Um, it was a different world. Um, and, you know, yes, there had been young black girls on other shows, but there was just something about those girls and their authenticity. And I hooked in and identified. And um, so I was very excited to get to Hollywood and meet one of the writers. Thanks, Meg. I was a little reluctant to answer that first that question first because I hadn't seen myself mm -hmm. until I was actually writing versions of myself mm -hmm. on television as mm -hmm. a young twenty something on a different world. So I mean that was a very kind of powerful experience for me because I had thought about that question yeah. <laughs> before. Like, why don't I see myself? And I realized because there was no platform to see myself. There was no one like myself also giving voice to those kinds of characters. And it's interesting because I was thinking about that and I just, I remember Janet Jackson on Good Times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was like the closest right. for me because right. there she was, this young girl who was about my age, who looked like me. Her experience as that character was not my experience. Right. Like Regina King on 227 also. I exactly. had the same experience. Exactly. Like. But I was so happy. I mean, that was like event television. I had to watch it because I had to see Janet Jackson on TV. Right. <laughs> you know, for me, as somebody who wrote something that was so personal in my first show, Awkward, to then discover that the greatest fan base for my show were kids who were not white was motivating me to create the show on my block to really see this, these kids who don't see themselves represented all the time or, or ever really as the smartest, funniest, uh, most heartwarming kids on the block, you know? And how imperative that is and how transformative that's been to my career to, to bring something to the business and to television that connects in such a fundamental way and doesn't just connect with the kids who feel represented, but it connects with people who don't have those friends. Mm -hmm. So through the show, the power of what we do, it isn't brain surgery, but it is the most important way to connect um, people together is when you actually see somebody that you love and you connect with that you might not know in your community. Um, and that's really powerful. And we have the privilege of being able to make those connections more than probably any other sector of, of our society. For, for me, the first time I really felt, you know, represented was when Ellen came out yeah. uh, in yeah. Yeah. 1997. Um, not just like on her show, but in real life sure. and on Time Magazine and, you know, so much so that when that show was happening, I was, I was 19, I was in college, but my mom was watching the show at home um, and uh, my father came home and from work and he's like, what are you watching? And she's like, I'm watching the show where Ellen is going to come out of the closet. And he's like, why are you watching that? And she's like, it's about your daughter. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, that is the power of, a, of, a, of an episode of television yeah. to, like, absolutely, like, illuminate and just, you know, show people that, you know, there are... Um, there are lots of different types of people out there, and, and, and sometimes they're your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. The first time I saw myself in any artistic work was in a play 
when I saw like the Chicano experience, which is like being a child of immigrants and growing up in the U.S. and how different that experience is from growing up in Mexico, growing up in any other part and living between worlds. And then when I started to think more deeply about it, I remember the movie Selena. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, and there's this one part where Eddie almost is like, we're, you're Mexican American. You're not Mexican enough for the Mexicans. You're not American enough for the <laughs> Americans. You're on the you're on the board. You're between worlds. You're between borders. I'm like, yes, that's that's me. And like every person that I know that is like me who has grown up with parents who are immigrants and the way that we are always trying to chase the American dream while still like satisfying our parents' cultural needs, which is like, don't go too far away. Mm. Like, don't go too far. Stay with your family, especially as a woman. Like, um, growing up when I was younger. I mean, just even asking to go away to college was like, in terms of the machismo in the community was like a big thing. So seeing someone like Selena, like doing that stuff was really interesting. But I'm gonna be honest, like another, other shows that really, I resonated with more were shows by the African American community, Another World, mm -hmm. um, Family Matters, like Fresh Prince, um, Girlfriends, like those shows spoke to me more than a lot of the white shows that were on the air because I felt like there was something to be experienced that I resonated with in a different way because I think, you know, I'm a brown woman and I travel through the world in a very different way. And um, ex seeing that experience to some degree connecting to that was the shows that I gravitated towards. Like those conversations around like, you know, how you have to act in front of white folks, how you have to like hide things around your, from, about your family that it's a little bit different. I think also with Latino and Latinx folks, it's like we're such an array of races and often we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the representation for Latinos is often white Latinos. Mm -hmm. And I think for me and this, yeah. this, this time, I'd love to see more shows that show indigenous Latin, Latinxes like Yalitza Paricio mm -hmm. and, and Afro-Latinas. And like, mm -hmm. I wanna see that kind of come through for our community more, but I would say Selena mm -hmm. to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> To be a strong woman in our business, to be a boss, you know, I come with kindness. I'm like tough with hugs is how I like to think of myself, <laughs> you know, and um, and now I'm like totally have been indoctrinated to make sure I ask people if they're okay with hugs. But, um, <laughs> but this notion that to be a strong woman, to be a woman who is decisive and strong and is like, I have to be careful. I have to modulate. I have to be you know, worried that people are gonna think I'm emotional because I'm a crier mm -hmm. and I, I, I lead with my heart and, and that's how I just do my job. But you know, it comes under the context of can she handle it? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's so unfair and it's so frustrating because as we are all artists, without our hearts leading the way, we can't connect to our audiences, you know? We should be proud of being a woman and using our hearts to lead the way. I'd have to say that a moment that I felt unseen in this business was also kind of a pivotal and career-defining moment for me. And it was the moment when I got my first set of notes on the first show I created, Living Single. And they wanted me to remove the character of Maxine Shaw oh. from the show. Oh, wow. Because she was unapologetically black and female and fierce. And all of the things that if I wasn't at that time, I wanted to be ultimately. <laughs> and I knew that that would be a powerful um, force in the world because I know that our art is, a, you know, our art is our activism. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that voice had been missing. Um, and I was told to take the character out of the show in order to get the show picked up. Oh. And mm -hmm. even though I had everything to lose, I stood my ground and said to take Maxine Shaw out of the show is to take a big part of me out of the show and I'd rather not do the show. I have this voice, I have the ability to help others, and I'm gonna continue to do that. Something's changed. Logic, reason, discourse, it's out the window now. I was one of three protest leaders. I wasn't the one who busted up a window or dropped a bombshell about the Hancocks and a fire. How do I even begin to respond to this? Sam, you started a conversation. This isn't a conversation. It's really hard to speak up as a woman too and to be worried about coming across as shrill or like worrying if, if you're the only woman in the room too, whether your opinion is valid and whether it's gonna be taken as valid. Like, 
I mean, on when you know, I'm gonna bring my. What does it look like in animation? Because it's animation, such a male-dominated so world. It's right? so male-dominated. I was trying to think of examples I've seen in adult animation where I see myself in another character, and they're so rare. And um, I had a. And it, you know, just as an example on BoJack, I noticed um, all the background gags that you see in between scenes, just little background things, they don't matter, but they were all with male characters. Um, and I raised the issue, I you know, put up a speed bump and everyone was mad at me for a few days because I was like, why are they all men? Women are funny and gross too. There was, <laughs> there was a gag where like a car rushes by and a dog's tongue whooshes and, and licks the lady next to her, and I wanted them both to be women. And everyone was like, "Well, why? That'll complicate things. If it's two women, people will wonder why they're both women. And if it's a man and a woman, <laughs> it'll be sexual. And like, you have to draw the boobs on the character, and that complicates it too, because people will be looking at her boobs. And I was like, "This is ridiculous." <laughs> <laughs> women are gross, women are funny, like, we need to represent that. And it became this whole argument for days, and then luckily, you know, because I have a wonderful showrunner on that show, Raphael, who created the show, he listened and admitted he was wrong to ask why it would be women, but... Yeah, it just it was very frustrating. Coming off of running Dead to Me, I, uh, several people have commented, like, you really, like, held your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Like, A, that that was sort of right. a feat. Surprise! Um, and, uh, which, like, and sometimes it is sort of a feat. Sure. But, but, but I, my, my true answer to that is, I have to. Yeah. I, as, a, as a woman, I can't lose my shit. I can't yell. I can't do so many of the behaviors that I have seen male showrunners do. Um, as a woman, you'd never get hired back. No, if you, you would just if you be lost your shit. And Men you can crazy. do it over and over again and be yeah. big babies. Exactly, and they're fine, strong but. and and they know what they want. Yeah. But, but they're more sensitive, actually. Yes, they are. Because <laughs> it was so interesting. In our room, it was mostly women, uh, and I think there were three men or four men in the room, and we would be having conversations specifically about women, female characters. For example. Um, they were talking about this one woman whose husband has cheated on her, and this guy was like, well, yeah, okay, so she goes out and she has an affair with somebody because she wants revenge. I was like, really? Maybe she just wants something for herself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the men in the room were kind of like, what? <laughs> and, and even like, every, and when we challenged them on certain things, like they, they would get all in their feelings a little bit. Like mm -hmm. they were not used to mm -hmm. having women sort of clap back at, well, no, you really don't know women. Right. And you need to hear from us. Um, but I think ultimately they felt like they, they learned. Yeah. But I did see them get very sensitive and feel a little something about being the minority in the room, mm -hmm. which was really great for us, you know. Yeah, I also had a majority female writer of 80% women. And any time anything ever got heated, it was between the two men. Right. Yeah. And right. I was like, right. oh, this is fun. Right. <laughs> this, right. this is like, I'm like, have you noticed that everybody else can just right. sort of have a conversation and if like they're disagreed with, it's. They're so okay. emotional. They're very men talented. So dramatic. They're so they're emotional. So they're emotional, emotional and dramatic. <laughs> I, know. I know. I've seen a man get so mad in the workplace that he kicked a chair and broke his own toe. And I've never seen a woman do that. <laughs> I had a director, a man, say to me that I was producing at one point, he was like, I was saying something he didn't like. He's like, oh, you better back off or the animal was gonna come out. I was like, the animal? His animal? <laughs> I was like, what kind of animal? That's what I said. Yeah. And then I said, I want to see it. Is it a bear? Or I was like, I like, want to see right. the animal. Bring it out. Right. Bring that animal out. It'll be a giraffe exactly. when I'm done. It's a fish. Exactly. <laughs> Bring it out. I mean, there is definitely a pay gap, and you know, it's 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 definitely under the surface because it's not like we all go around talking about how much we make and all of that, but. I, I noticed it very early on. Uh, I was working on a show. I wasn't a, a showrunner yet, but I was. I think I was like a producer or something. And there was a there was a, another uh, a gentleman who was also a producer, and he offhandedly sort of just said what he was making, and it was um, I think it was like fifty percent more than me. Wow. And wow. I had been in the business much longer than yeah. him, and I I just was like, re I was so. Um, <laughs> sure upset about it <laughs> and you know I mean I am sort of the person who's like well if, if that's how it is I'm gonna change that you know and so you know moving forward I was like well it's funny because if you think I have as much value as this fella um, you should um, you should pay me like like this fella and if you don't want to pay me um, like like that guy um, you know I'll just I'll go somewhere else you know that that will pay me like that and 
you know, you start to, it's hard, like, we, you know, as women, especially women of certain generations, like, you know, to ask for what you really deserve or what you feel you deserve feels scary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as I was moving forward in my career and making other sort of deals, I asked um, my agent to find out exactly what every man makes you know, you have to you have to ask for it, and it is really hard to feel like it's okay to ask for what you deserve. I see the years have not been kind to you, and gravity is not your friend. Is your husband still dead? You still got the herpes? At least I am getting late. Once a skank, always a skank. Yeah, well, it takes one to know one. Excuse me. Enough slut shaming. But you, you know what's to. also really interesting? In my experience, I've had more women try to keep me down than men. I have found um, that the women either that I work under, you know, who are my, you know, studio bosses, network bosses, whatnot, um, have been harder on me and, you know, sometimes having representation that has been women that aren't advocating for me in the right way versus men who have been able to say to me, that would never be said to a man, what just got mm. said to you. Um, that's not okay that you're not being paid the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, that's only recently, but I have noticed a big difference, and I don't know if you guys have seen that too with other women. You know, we should all be supporting each other. To be a pro woman does not mean I'm anti-man. Yeah, I mean, I think women can absolutely reinforce the patriarchy. Like, that's what we've been conditioned into. Mm -hmm. Like, that's such mm -hmm. a part of the infrastructure that we've been raised in. And there's so much unpacking of that that we have to do yeah. from a very early age. Like I, I feel like we all are constantly coming into facing our own isms, I guess, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and a lot of times that comes, I think, from our own sense of the the same thing that's been created, which is we all have to be in competition. We all have to be fighting for the same resources. And, yeah. and for me specifically, being Latina, I think there are very few of us in the industry from what I've been experiencing, for especially sure. very recently, I'm like, oh, okay. I knew that, but it's like, it's always a new, every time you hit, you're hit with it, I think it can, you're fighting against that that intuition to like, oh, there's only one spot, I gotta fight, I gotta fight, and taking a step back and saying, no, I don't have to fight, we have to support each other and uplift each other. But early on, it was really scary for me, because I'm like, I resonate really hard with you being like, I'm so nice, I don't wanna like bother mm -hmm. anyone, I'm like, oh, that's me, like I just like struggle <laughs> with like, being like, oh no, is everyone happy, and, and I struggle with being like, am I happy? Like that question, oh, I yeah. always have to ask really myself, powerful. like I'm yeah. putting everybody else first. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a female thing too. And and so with my co-creator very early on, it was terrifying for me to be like, hey, I need you to be my ally. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. people are gonna subconsciously do things to, um, and I, we have an amazing, I love everyone on our team and all that good stuff, but things happen subconsciously that they don't even know they're doing. For me specifically, I think in this industry, people who look like me are usually the help. They're mm -hmm. usually your maid or your nanny. And so there's a subconscious thing that happens that is like, oh, you're less valued because of that. Or like, we're not gonna see you. Or if you're really nice, stay quiet to the right. Mm -hmm. So needing him to be an ally for me was a question that I posed to him very early on. It's like, I can't go on this journey unless I know that you are going to advocate for me because you're a man that you're always gonna be seen differently no matter what. Um, and I was blessed that he was just like, yeah, let's do this. Like, let, let me <laughs> let me be your ally in every step of the way. And that's been a journey for the two of us too. Like him unpacking his his stuff too. Like, been many moments where I've called him out, and he's like, I love it. Keep calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I'm going to. The difference between earlier in your career and a little later in your career, where I am now, is the need to please. Even though it can stay with us. I have the confidence now to be like, I have a right to expect you to do your job mm -hmm. and not have to beg you to do it. And yet, I will tell you this, that attitude has had me labeled intimidating. Even <laughs> as I'm as approachable as they come, hugs, kisses, love, Mama Meg, which I, I learned actually from Mama Yvette. But <laughs> that being said, I was labeled intimidating. And it was suggested that I go around to the various departments and say, are you okay? Are you afraid to talk to me? Oh are you, and you know what? And I, I made, and by the way, the suggestion was made by another woman um, and I made it clear I don't have time for that right okay all I want is for people to do their job I want them to be happy but I want them to do their job and I'm not gonna apologize for expecting them to do it
weave into your path to where you are now? What is a call sheet? <laughs> <laughs> Just your first title in the business. Just your first title. My first title on a call sheet was a staff writer on a show called All That uh, in uh, 1995. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> my first title on the call sheet was assistant to a producer, a very um, fancy feature producer, Arnold Kobelson. So, yeah. I'll just leave it there, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My first title in the business was Apprentice, which meant I was an apprentice writer, which also meant that I was writing lunch orders, mm -hmm. <laughs> taking notes, making posters for Whitley in the dorm. She was running for <laughs> dorm president. Um, everything but writing was part of my job. And I was also, back to the comp compensation angle, compensated 94 cents an hour. No one Stop ever made that what? so little money to Wait, do what? so much work. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Um, yeah, because I was basically working for free. Right. Mm. Um, but that changed after I started pitching stories and things like that. So again, you ha always have to show your value. But my first job was as a writer's apprentice on a different world. I was fresh out of college. Um, it was a tremendous opportunity for me. And um, because there was such a shortage of um, recent college experience in the room, um, I was actually heard. And so wow. it, you know, just kind of sticking it out being, you know, tolerating being undercompensated um, paid off. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that stuff I was saying yesterday about eagles and the things that they like to do. Okay, anything new today? Maybe we could advertise to, like, hawks, too. <laughs> That's the alarm that sounds when no women have spoken out loud for three minutes. <laughs> I, what I love, um, I produced a film uh, a couple years ago, and there was this one woman on set. I mean, she was just so, she was a PA, fantastic at her job. I didn't know anything about what she was doing. We didn't talk. We weren't girlfriends. We were working. We were, we were making a movie. But at the end, um, at our rap party, she was telling me about movies that she, you know, movies she was doing. She had a Kickstarter and all of this stuff. I mean, I was amazed at who she really was. Um, and then I was happy to help her. But I appreciated that when she was at the job in ha at hand, she was doing the job. She did not talk to me about, you know, helping her out right. until we were done. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to do it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and that's just the best to me. I think also like when when you're finally the person who gets to hire all the people like it's it, it's you know that's the greatest empowerment that you yes. have that you can give to other people and so yeah. like for me it was absolutely imperative that most of my writers be women and it was a hundred percent imperative that all of my directors be women and or LGBTQ um, and you know like that's that's something that I really learned from working with Ellen because before that I had basically always been the only female in the room. I mean, I've been primarily a comedy writer and in the comedy world, there are just, at, especially back then, there just were so few women. This is suddenly I, I work for Ellen and everybody's a woman and so many of them are gay and it was like, I finally felt like- And they were good at their job. Really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the best joke writers I've ever worked with. And I, I just, I, I was like, oh, you can do that. Like you, you can, you can pick the people that you feel represented by, that you feel connected to. Um, and, and so that's like absolutely what I tried to do because I, I mean, I, I hired one of my best friends who's um, a woman who had never written on a show before, but she had been through a lot of the personal experiences that uh, one of my characters went through. And I'm like, you know what? She wrote an amazing script. Who else is going to give her a shot? Like, I'm going to yeah. hire her. And she was amazing, you know, and, and so, and grateful. And, you know, I think I think that that's like to me the greatest gift of, of being a successful person is that you can lift other people up and give them the shot that somebody yeah. gave you. Um, you know, my show is set in the inner city, and I made a point to say I want to bring in young people who live in communities like South Central, and I have three incredible young kids: um, Walter Finney, Kylan Turner, and Alexi Gonzalez, who um, are all from really rough neighborhoods, Inglewood, Watts, and Fontana, and they have a place, at, the seat at my table, they have an equal voice. Alexi, who's my assistant, and was also a story consultant, she's such a badass, she's 22 years old, and I looked at her and I said, you are a producer, I'm gonna make you a producer, and she's now the associate producer of our show. Hard That's fought, awesome. but I said, she just is that. She has to have that title, and with that, 
You know, I'm looking at a kid who I said, you know, listen, you're gonna go places and I wanna be there to watch you go there. When women take no money and people of color take no money just to have the job, you're basically saying, and this has been my entire career, you know, um, I'll work for free because it's okay or I'll work for this shitty paycheck because I love the work. But the truth is, when you work for free, you get treated like you work for free. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why all these diversity programs and gender equality programs are not working mm -hmm. because they're making people free. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be doing that. It's not okay. It's actually not helping us, it's hurting us. You know, I mean, that's just my thought about yeah. it. I still want to see all those programs. Hopefully people coming through them, but we need to fix that. But you want the money to exist to continue yes. to hire those people, people year after year. I want people to incentivized to teach people oh, right. so those kids have the opportunity when you have like the kid who came from Harvard and his parents are subsidizing him to write on his couch for three years, <laughs> you know, because he doesn't want to be an assistant and get coffee and do all the shit that we had to do. Mm -hmm. And he, the kid who got the job, who, who pulled himself up by his bootstraps and worked four jobs to like get to the point where they got their script read and got to the table and they're the free staff writer. I have a low income background. My parents are immigrants. It's a very different way of getting into the industry. It's difficult. You don't know anybody yeah. in this industry. And that's what's led to me get, taking so long to even get to this point because mm -hmm. part of the battle is like working four to five jobs, yeah. mm -hmm. having to take oh, care yeah. of your family and your family needs because it's, they need you in ways that other folks may not need totally. you. And then also just meeting a lot of young folks who are coming up and I hope that this leads to a renaissance for us is just a lot of folks coming up in the business who are in digital, who are doing their own film projects, who are young, who are raw, who like I know just need some like polishing and some, yeah. and some resources and some mentors. Mm -hmm. And I always, when I talk to them, I'm like, listen, I'm gonna be your tia in the industry. I'm gonna be your prima, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be your cousin, your tia. I, I'm here, call me. I don't have that much yet, but the little bit I have, I do know is more than most of the folks in my community. And so I always tell them, listen, mm -hmm. I'll be that person. I'll be your family. I'll make that call. Like you got to work hard, but I'll do it. Sometimes feel like there's a standard that's set. That's a, a standard that's been set by white supremacy. Like yep. this is the way you're supposed to act in a space. This is the way you're supposed yes. to be. Mm -hmm. And like, I it took me a long time to be myself in spaces to like not code switch into like my white voice. <laughs> and like this is how I said because I I'm a low income kid who went to Stanford. And when I went there, it was like whoa, like it was like a big old like culture clash for me, and it was difficult. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn real quick how to talk, how to present myself, and I had to unlearn that to become the artist that I am. Mm -hmm. For people to see like oh, what makes you special is who you are, and to like remove those layers was a process. And so I think, yes, th there needs to be accessibility and that needs to be seen, but it's also, we gotta see, change the system that's telling us that there's something wrong with the, who you are when you come into this space. There's nothing wrong with you. Like, you are who you are. Let me teach you how to navigate this world in which everybody's gonna tell you that you're wrong. You're not wrong but some people are gonna try to treat you differently because of it, here's how you navigate those people. Here's how you get around them and still be yourself and be powerful and, and speak for who you are yeah. and not feel bad about who you are, where you come from. My parents are fucking immigrants, yes. They, I was low income, yes. Like all those things are me and I'm not gonna apologize for those things and I think that that's a thing that, for me in terms of mentorship, is also empowering those young folks to know that they are not less than because of who they are. Yes. I would like you to know the only reason I'm doing this is because folks think they know me. They think they know what I'm about. And the truth is, they don't know me. I consider myself abnormal, but who wants to be like everybody else? Not I. I talked to Spike about um, bringing She's Gotta Have It as an episodic series. And um, I really did that because I felt like it would be exciting to explore this woman that he created um, 30 years ago um, today and talk about the issues of what it is to be a young woman walking through this life. And I also thought it would be really great to be able to have a say in uh, who this woman is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, he will say, I mean, he certainly created Nola, he did. Um, and I think there are certain things that he did in that film that um, when he looks back now, he might not have done. Um, but, you know, being able to have a voice myself and to bring other women to really flush her out um, as an artist who is navigating the world um, was exciting to me.
one of the main characters on my show, played by Loretta Devine, is Madeer. And she is a grandmother who is old school, and yet I'm turning her into a superhero. Mm. And I'm doing that because I happen to think that women, and particularly black women, are badass. Are. And I want to see this woman who's got so much wisdom, but who's always, you know, often marginalized and perceived a certain way as being so multidimensional and who can do just a little bit of everything and do it all well. Mm -hmm. Well, the women on my show are all birds, and so I was really <laughs> hoping for more bird representation. Um, no, I mean, the women on my show, I mean, it's really important for me to show how funny women are and that we're gross and, like, you know, the, the characters on my show joke about their periods and, like, we see their butts and, like, one of them has, like, you know, weird bugs in her pubes and, like, there's whole plots about that and, like, I, I just really wanted to yeah just open up like how wacky and strange we are and it's not just the men who get to be disgusting and like and funny um especially in you know animation you know there's something that steve said that really really bothered me what he said you were nuts oh yeah that's well it's practically my nickname N no but that's not okay Men call women nuts and crazy way too often, just to undermine us. Um, I think uh, uh, my show, though it has absolutely nothing to do with this industry, and it doesn't even, it could almost take place in any time, but I, I definitely felt as we were writing it that this sort of Me Too moment that we were in um, is definitely a motif that is never said, but I think is felt. Um, because again, because so many of the writers were women, it's just our experience uh, on a cellular level at this point. Um, and uh, both of my lead characters, uh, one played by Christine Applegate, the other by Linda Cardellini, are very different. But at the core of my show, it's about female friendship. And for me, um, my friendships uh, with women have been the, the sort of powerful thread that has gotten me through every difficult moment. Mm -hmm and the good ones, but you know, the, just the, the, the power of women uplifting each other. And in, in, in my particular uh, situation on, on this show is that these are two women who uh, are beyond unlikely friends. They probably, in fact, shouldn't be friends, <laughs> but they just love each other and they uh, uplift each other th through uh, this really difficult moment that they're both in. And you know, for me, like, that's my expression of like, how I feel uh, about women. Well, I didn't create the show that I currently run, but I do see my role as a woman and as a writer and a person of color to really kind of help um, voice these like enviable female friendships in every mm -hmm. show I ever mm -hmm. work on. Yeah. That's, like that's really my thing. Do. Like the friendships that I have, I see, I, I, I hold so dear to my mm -hmm. heart, and I want everyone to experience that. And if they don't have it in their own life, they can come and watch these characters yeah, exactly. and maybe seek it in their own lives. I mean, I just, I just feel like my friendships, my female friendships have propped me up through mm -hmm. every phase of my life, yep. you know, from coming up as a child of poverty, going to Stanford like Linda, <laughs> you know, not really knowing my place in the world because I, there was such a juxtaposition between, you know, where I came from and where I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't really kind of have information about where I was going, but my girlfriends have always been kind of those pillars for me. Mm -hmm. And so that's really been kind of important in every single show that I've ever done. And to also, you know, let the guys in the room know that it's okay to depict women as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's really, I mean, yeah. in, so, in so many ways, kind of depicting us as vulnerable is a window in to understanding us. Yeah. And also, you know, letting us be as complicated as, as, as men are. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just do a couple. Let's roll sound. So we're going to have all and of you. Roll sound.